I'd like to call the meeting to order at 701. It's October 6, 2020, 701. Uh, first order of business, uh, review and approve the minutes from September 10th. So moved. Second. And we'll do a roll call. Judy, you want to do the roll calls? Yep, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Bob Halla? Yes. Lynn Roberts? Yep. Bill Cantor? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Sorry, Missy. Yeah, okay. That's okay. <laughs> Judy, Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Bill? Yes. Keith? Yes. And Damien? Yes. Okay. Just so you guys know, I'm not um, looking at the screen. I'm either, I, it's a typer look, so voices are required. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next thing is uh, financial statement, Shelly. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I sent out a very short report, um, and I did also attach the expenditure reports for school choice and general fund. There's not a whole lot to update you on financially this month. There's not really been much change. Um, <clears throat> if you have individual line item questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, we continue to track our COVID-related expenditures, making sure that we're utilizing grant funding first. Um, we're also currently in discussion with the towns um, regarding <clears throat> their Municipal Cares Act funding. We did get some uh, from our towns in the initial allotment that they received and they're about to go and submit for the second allocation of the CARES Act funding. So we are gonna try to put in for some expenditures for Frontier because Frontier is not allowed to access those funds because we're not a municipality. Um, whereas the elementary schools, they can really <clears throat> request more than Frontier can and access that money in a different way. Um, but we've been very fortunate that our town administrators have included us in the process of budgeting how they're going to spend that COVID money. Um, so we'll continue to see what we can get there. Um, I want to say we probably spent maybe close to $150,000 on COVID-related expenses at this point, um, grant-related primarily. You will see some expenditures on the school choice report. Those are some of the things that we're going to ask for support from the towns from, um, includes PPE, HVAC repairs, things along those lines. Um, but otherwise, there's not a whole lot to update on, you know, monitoring school lunch, like I said last month. Um, meals have been minimal at this point because we've done a phase in approach. So there haven't been a lot of students in the building to serve meals to. Um, but hopefully, you know, we'll have better numbers through this month that I can monitor what's coming in for revenue and what's going out for expenses and then give you a better update next month. The reimbursement from the government is minimal. It's about $2.20 a day for breakfast. I can't remember the exact lunch number. I think it's close to like $3.35 or $3.45 a day um, per meal. So, you know, certainly not a lot of money, especially if students are bringing their own lunch and our numbers are much smaller of students in the school actually having breakfast or lunch every day, but hopefully it'll be enough to at least cover um, food costs. So, happy to take questions if you have them. Um, Shelly, I, you're, thank you for printing. And I just, I just went through it and I just look at negative numbers and I, and, and I made a couple little notations, you know, I, I don't want to hold anybody up or hold the meeting up, but if you can just address, address it, maybe the next meeting, you know, if, if you have time, I know you got a lot going on. I got the first page I'm looking at, like the receptionist salaries that's, you know, over 77% over at $10,000. Just something that, that everybody know what's going on. You know, everybody just looks at it maybe on the computer. I had it printed, so I'm, I'm making little check marks on, you know, a few things. Um, salary for tech training, you know, it's it's a percent, you know, if it's 10% or higher, I'm looking at it and just making little notes and stuff. That's all. Yeah, those are really good questions. And those are the kind of things that you want to be on the lookout for. And if you actually go back and look at last month's report and the month before that, you will see a lot more negative numbers. So what I've been doing is working with the payroll department to make sure 
that the staffing are in the right categories. And what's happening is, I think I explained this last time, but I know it's hard to understand because you don't look at the system every day like we do. But when we roll over the database, a lot of times people stay in the same category they were the prior year, even if I manually change the category. So then payroll has to go back and fix some of those things. Um, that's what's happening in a lot of the teaching positions. We move some folks around so that they're paid from a different source. So you might actually see a teaching line that has not expended its full amount, um, whether it's an IA or a teacher. So if you look on page three of this report, just as an example, you'll see that the uh, special education IAs are overspent by 10,000, but yep. then the life skills instructional assistants, the IAs in the life skills program are underspent by 35,000. So I'm still working with payroll to get everybody in the right categories. And this is something that I'm looking at very closely month to month to make sure that we're not over actually overexpended and we'll continue to clean them up. Um, one of the things to answer your first question specifically about the receptionist position, that account, <clears throat> we had a staffing change. So um, Rhonda has left Frontier, Sarah came on in her position, and for some reason the database is not picking up that Rhonda no longer works for us. So again, it's really just cleanup kind of things. I'm not overly concerned about any of the accounts at this point. Um, there might be some minor overages, couple hundred dollars here or there. I think the only account for salaries and wages that's on my radar that's negative right now is um, custodial, and I am looking into why they're over. I expended at this point and in conversation with Bill about to, you know, to make sure that we're tightening the reins, no overtime unless necessary, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but most of the accounts I have a pretty good handle on with the payroll department and hope to have those cleaned up next month. Thank you. Um, but I'm happy you asked that. Those are the kind yeah. of questions that I, I want to be able to answer for you. And in regards to salaries, um, I see that all uh, sports coaches are hundred percent. Does that mean we have everything being played? Um, so right now there are some fall sports being paid on a limited capacity. And what we have agreed to do is to pay those coaches um, football, for example, because they're only practicing two days a week and they're not going to be playing any games this season. Um, they're being paid one quarter of their, wage right now to work with the students for conditioning and strength chaining, things that are non-contact that are approved by MIAA. And then if we can run another season for them like the MIAA has um, proposed for us come late February before the spring season starts, if they're able to participate in full capacity, they will get the rest of their, their salary there. Right. Um, but other sports like field hockey, they're playing their regular season. They're having games. So we are paying those coaches. So everything is staying in there as it stands right now, just to hold on to that money to make sure that we have it available. Okay. I just, I saw footballs a hundred percent. So that's, it, yeah, I just noticed it today. I didn't, I didn't, I knew they weren't playing, but there must be some rhyme or reason to everything. And, you know, yeah, it's just a that question that I saw. So. It's a really great question. The same goes for the expenses related to athletics. So we are leaving all of that money in there. Um, I spoke to the athletic director the other day. You know, it, they're not buying as much as they used to if they're not running the program, but we don't want to take that money away at this point and reallocate it in case something happens, you know, within a, a shorter truncated season for those fall sports. And, you know, same for the winter. We don't know what the MIAA is going to approve for basketball or, you know, certainly I can't imagine they're going to be wrestling. Um, but can we keep those kids active in some way and, you know, pay the coach some portion of their stipend? Okay. Good. Those are great questions, Bob. Uh, Phil? So, yeah, Shelly, just to uh, follow up on Bob's uh, question a little bit about um, about custodial expenses, I would think this is a year where we should be running over uh, our, our estimates. And, and I wonder whether we increased, you know, shouldn't this be a year where we should be increasing that line item? And, I mean, this is the pandemic yeah, year of all 
We have increased um, one staff member who was 20 hours a week to 40 hours a week. Um, so we've certainly added staff and we're not cutting any corners. You know, the bill had did a really good job of training his staff on what was necessary to be done in the building and then putting a handbook together that all of the staff has access to on what the cleaning protocols are um, and making sure that, you know, all of the COVID needs are being met. So we're certainly not I don't want to give the impression that we're, you know, penny pinching there and we're not doing what we need to as far as cleaning and custodial work. Um, but we did have some savings over the summer. Um, our staff were, they were able to do some projects that they would normally do in the summertime in the spring when we were more shut down. Um, so we've had some savings there that's allowed us to add those wages. But, you know, I'm just keeping a close eye on all of it. It's a good point, Phil. And then is is that increase from 20 to 40, is that position, is, wouldn't that be a COVID expense, a, a CARES Act expense? Yeah, we could certainly try to submit it. Um, but again, the the towns would have to pitch in for that because Frontier doesn't get, you know, this municipal allotment and the grant funding that we did get, um, we're not using it for salaries and wages. It's going mostly to technology and then hybrid learning model needs tents tables, chairs, that kind of thing. But we can absolutely put in for that on the town level and see if any of the towns can contribute back to that. But we would ask we would ask the four towns for COVID relief in that case, right? Correct. Would that be the only fair way to do it? We don't want to put it all on Deerfield or-, or No, Con it would be, it'd so. be based on the cost share allocation between the, the five because Frontier would still pay a portion of that. So it would be split five ways based on the enrollment cost share percentage. Thank you. Anybody else have anything for Shelly? Phil, you have anything else? No? Okay. Um, I uh, texted Donna before the meeting. We had no public comment because we go through email and uh, she didn't have anything as of three o'clock. Um, does, I can ask the committee, uh, committee members if anybody wants to say something. If not, um, we'll go on to reports. Olivia, is your daughter around tonight? Mine you know? or Olivia's? Oh, hi there. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. So, so what, do you have for, what do you have for a student council report tonight? I actually have quite a lengthy report because we were able to meet Monday after school outside which was really nice just to see everybody and sort of get a feel for how the first month has been going for everybody. So the first thing we talked about was we started working on a survey to anonymous, anonymously give to the students. Um, and we wanted to make sure that was okay to, uh, we just want to run that by you to make sure that was okay to give out to the students and then report back on the data we got about Schoology and hybrid and remote and sort of how that's working together. Um, and it's anonymous so students can be as honest as they would like to be without feeling like they're being judged by their peers because we're not collecting email addresses and we're not connect collecting names, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, we wanna make sure that that was okay with school committee that we did that. Well, what do you think, Darius? Is uh, I would I would say the information would be good. I'm not sure about any other committee members or something we have to vote on. <laughs> Bill, um, so no, you don't need to, to vote on that. We can do internal surveys um, without uh, the school committee approval. I would I would ask the that you have one of the, the Mr. Lenny just look over it to make sure it's a. Uh, just have someone proof it before it goes out. Okay, okay. So approved by the administration. Just make sure the questions are what the questions are. Wonderful, so we'll get that sent out. Um, the second thing we discussed was sort of um, seniors. Well, seniors were the only ones at the meeting, so that was a topic that was brought up. Sort of senior privileges and how do we work with that? Um, we've noticed that morale um among seniors is really low nobody really wants to do anything it's been really hard to sort of get involvement 
in a lot of different things and we were wondering um, maybe if we could even paint spots in the parking lot, if that's something we can do. If not, can we eat, have lunch in our cars so we can take a mask break and sort of collect ourselves um, before our last class and have a break um, from the hustle and bustle of the day because normally we would be allowed to leave for lunch, but that's no longer a possibility. Um, and we were also wondering if there could be um, sort of, not necessarily seniors, but if we could decorate part of the school so that not only the seniors, but everybody has a little bit of cheer because it can be sort of hard to just walk through and nobody's in the building when you're used to having lots and lots of people in there. Are you a senior? I am a senior, yeah. Good. <laughs> yep. Have you have you talk, have have you talked to the principal about some suggestions for the seniors? We have not. We're having a student uh, student council officer meeting in the next few days to sort of finalize that, and then we were hoping to approach Mr. Lenitas with sort of some ideas. Good. Um, approach away. <laughs> <laughs> And then our last topic was Schoology, um, which is going to be most of this report. So the first thing we have is, first of all, we just want to thank the teachers. We know that they're trying their best and it's really hard with everything um, and the different platforms. And we really want to thank them for trying their best. Um, I've heard a lot from all the grades about Mr. Blinder, and he's doing a wonderful job of making sure the hybrid students and the remote students are getting everything they need and classes are going smoothly, as smoothly as they can. And we just wanted to thank him for that because that was really awesome. We wanted to notice that. Uh, and something else is we've noticed that turning in assignments for some, if you handwrite something, you then have to scan it through your phone and upload it through the app on your phone. And then if you do do that, you cannot then submit a typed assignment to the same sort of grouping. Uh, and that's been an issue for classes such as math, where you need to handwrite things, but also do multiple choice. And like government, where we have handwriting also in multiple choice. And that's been a huge thing because teachers can't then have emails or from Google Classroom. All of these submissions are coming in from everywhere. And it's been confusing because assignments are reported missing or late, or they're just not uploading. And we need, we're looking into a better, is there a better way we can do that? Um, is, that also, more of a, is that more of a technology question? Or is that, I'm waiting for somebody are, else to chime in to help us out here. I mean. George? So one of the things we can certainly do um, is that when, when we actually, if you wanna if you want to set up a meeting with, with me and with Mr. Dredge, um, we can definitely talk about a lot of these things. And I think we, we would be able to sort of, to, to work through them with you because, um, you know, we'd be able to sort of tap people like our IT director, you know, um, in terms of helping us sort of figure out what the best way to approach these things is. So, I mean, we can certainly, I, I think that that's something that we should, because this is the first time I'm obviously hearing about about this, right? I usually don't have to turn my work in on Schoology. I just have to do Google <laughs> Meet. So, um, so, but that'll be helpful. So why, why don't we do that? And we can sort of wrap everything, we can wrap everything around, um, you know, when, when, we, when we talk. Does that sound fair? Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then just two more things and then I'll leave. Um, the First thing is we were hope we were asking that teachers try and use one platform. There are many students who have teachers who are using um, Google Classroom, Google Meet, Schoology, and other platforms. And we get it um, for AP Classroom, like that's a must. Um, that's not really an issue. But um, teachers who are using submitting assignments on Schoology and Google Classroom is getting confusing for students, and they're having a really tough time with that. And then one big question is um, a lot of students were um, just wondering, um, is there a timeline for when their teachers who are working remote are coming in? They are, 
were just worried and concerned and just wanted to make sure that there was a timeline for them to come in so they could go into class instead of being in the gym all day. So currently, um, so currently the teachers that are out, uh, if they've been approved for for medical leave, um, I believe it's for those teachers. I believe it's for the entire. It's for the school year. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And do I have anything else? Uh, I do not. Um, so we'll be setting up a meeting and with Mr. Lanitas and Mr. Dredge, and we'll report back with the survey in November. Okay. Thanks for your report. It, it was a really good report. Sometimes we don't get much, but it was <laughs> nice that you had a full list to show the school committee members. Thank Does you, it, and I will see you guys it, next. Hold on. So, do you I have a have question? To um, I've been on school committee ten years. These are your your reports are the best that I've I've heard in my ten years, and it, it's um, just gratifying to hear that the students have a voice at the table. And congrats to you for stepping up and being that person to be at the table for the students. So well done. Thank you so much. That means a real lot to me. Thank you. Lynn, do you have something, Lynn? Yeah. Um, how much training have the teachers been able to get in Schoology? Uh, are we talking hours or days, Lynn? We've got we've had numerous days where they've had training training on Schoology. Multiple days. I don't know offhand. I couldn't I couldn't give you a specific number, but uh, quite a bit. So they're pretty well uh, schooled, so to speak. They're pretty knowledgeable on how to use all the different features that would make life a little easier for them and for their students. I think I think as is the case with anything like that, I think you have some that are more adept at it than others. Anybody else have any questions? No? I have hey. a question. What? I, this is Missy. I have a question. Go ahead, Missy. Maddie, uh, last month you talked about um, some kids that were remote and having trouble balancing lunch is that still an issue or so uh it is still sort of an issue but we've gotten used to it over the past month kids have had time to sort of you know adjust to that it is it can still be tricky um just like anything is and just like lunch is hybrid it is tricky to balance everything and kids are getting there you know, sometimes uh, teachers will let them eat during class, which is really nice as long as their mics are off. Um, so they're working through that and hopefully it should be getting better in the next few weeks. All right, I just thought I'd follow up. And I, um, in our house, we've treated it like a, like a regular school day. So mm -hmm. like we've made lunch in the morning for everybody so that the, like for the high schoolers who are taking care of younger kids, they can, maybe coordinate with some parents <laughs> prep things yeah. ahead of time if that makes it easier. Yeah. But it doesn't all fall on them. <laughs> Can you do a follow up on that for the next meeting? Make sure everybody's doing that. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else have anything else? Hey, thanks for your for your report. Have a good no night. No problem. Thanks. Have a good night. I'll see you guys next month. Yep. Bye bye. Okay, uh, we're going to go right into unfinished business, anti-racism, and equality committee update. Hey, Bob, if we could, if we could put a pin in that one, um, Kelsey Crop is going to join us. She was on my meeting earlier tonight, so um, I know she's out there, but uh, she said she couldn't get here till about seven thirty. So if we could skip that one, then come back to it when she gets on, because she yeah, wants. Let, us, well, let me. When I see her, we'll we'll if we're in the middle of something, we'll finish it, and then we'll we'll pop back to her then. Thank you. Uh, George, you have an update on the update on school opening? Yeah, so I can so I can uh, give you an update on the school opening. So obviously, you know that so hybrid learning commenced on the 24th of September. Um, so we've been rotating uh, the cohorts uh, once a week. Um, and uh, Wednesday still remained remote. Uh, the second phase of hybrid is going to be starting uh, next Thursday. We'll, we'll have two cohorts reporting on that day. Um, 
we've had uh, we've had um, the feedback we've been getting from primarily from teachers, uh, from a lot of families, uh, and from kids is that they're glad to be back in the building, uh, that it's going well. Um, we've been able to. We've got kids working inside and outside. We've got we've got the ten tents outside, so we have classrooms outside as well. Uh, which is going well. Um, the kids are, the lunches are, are going, uh, are, are happening right now. Uh, folks are eating outside as well. Um, we've been trying to maintain uh, as much of the regular school day as we can. Uh, we, we've got school photos happening this week. Um, we've got uh, sports ha have started. We had a field hockey game today. We did lose to Turner's four to two, but we actually did have a game. Um, we're gonna be starting up uh, remote clubs. Obviously student council is happening. Um, but we've got the majority of our, our, our faculty who, who run clubs and, uh, and activities, they're going to be doing them remotely. So, um, you know, things are, you know, we've had our, but we, we've, we've had some bumps, but um, I think things are going in the right direction. Um, and it's been, it's been different, but I think, I think people are glad to be in the building. I think, um, I think, uh, I think, and I think we're going in the right direction. So. Thanks, George. You're welcome. Anybody, anybody have any questions for George? No. Okay. And we got some new business. Um, MASC Mass Joint Conference uh, nominee uh, official delegate. Um, who's going to do this, uh, Darius? So basically, um, this year it is remote. So you can't go to the, the, the Cape and, and do whatever. Um, it, the, the delegate needs to be available that you're um, nominating to be available at, on November 6th at 315, because that's when the meeting is going to take place when that delegate would have to vote on something. Um, they didn't give me an agenda of what's being voted on this year. There hasn't been a whole lot of action of, of things of huge significance, but you know we like to at least send one representative um, to be present for that meeting. The, the full MASC agenda for that meeting, I haven't seen it yet. Usually they send a, a pamphlet out to all of us. Um, it might be posted on the website. I haven't even looked at it yet. Um, but it's going to be remote this year. So um, kind of takes away some of the niceness of talking with other people from other districts and hearing about other other troubles. And sometimes it's good to hear other people's troubles. It helps you focus on yours. Um, but we'll, we'll see what they are able to come up with this year. So, but again, this is that person that votes at the delegate meeting and they have to be available on Friday, November 6th at 3.15. I'll look for a, I'll look for a hand who could be available to be our delegate. Not everybody jump in all at once here either. So <coughs> <clears throat> I'm on furlough that week. You can have me. Okay. I have the paperwork here, but I can let I'll let uh, Donna know, and I think uh, you probably have to sign something. No doubt. For Don, huh? I said no doubt. Okay. <laughs> so I'll I'll let Donna know it's you, and you could touch base with her in the near future here, and uh, we'll get it in for you. Okay, Judy. Yeah, you guys got to nominate me though. I need a motion. I nominate Judy Pierce. I'll second that. You want to do a roll call? I sadly I do. Yep. Um, <laughs> Bob, <laughs> Bob Hella. Yes. Ben Roberts. I vote twice. Oh, <laughs> Bill Cantor. Yes. Olivia. Yes. Judy. Yes. Mary. Yes. Uh, Damien. Yes. Bill Smith. Yes. E. Yes. T. Yes. Pleasure to serve, kids. Thank you, Judy. Yep. Okay, we got a good one here. Snow day discussion only. So the, <laughs> this is for discussion only um, in the sense of, I didn't know quite, um, you know, Kelsey just joined. Maybe we should pause, let her do her report so she can get in and out. And then yep. you just can think about snow days until when we come okay. back. <laughs> Kelsey, um, you on? I sure am. Can you give us a nice report, please? I sure can. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we've had some big happenings at the high school in terms of the anti-racism committee recently. 
Um, we met, we being George, Scott, Sarah, Melissa Strelke, and myself, um, with some representatives from UMass, uh, some PH PhD graduate students um, who are going to design a, P a professional development um, course for our teachers. So we're going to have our first meeting with them for professional development will be November 3rd, and then there will be four more meetings after that date um, to take our whole staff um, through anti-racism professional development. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, we announced today that um, we're going to participate as a school in FERCOG's um, Communities That Care Coalition presentation of the documentary, I'm Not Racist, Am I? Um, which is, they're paying for it. It's being streamed live um, at 6.30 on October 19th, which is a Monday. So there will be an online link for students to access. And then it will also be broadcast on the local channels. So we're hopeful that students who don't have great internet access can, can watch it um, through the cable. Um, so students will be receiving credit for a short reflection write-up that they're going to do. And then the next day when they come in, um, they'll be receiving some material about um, the student-facing campaigns that we're doing this year, which are to end the use of the N-word um, and then to also redesign our school logo. Um, so they'll be getting information about that and then having time to, to discuss both the film and those announcements um, as a group during their C-Block classes. Um, so that is exciting exciting stuff for the high school students. Um, we also have our peer leadership group back up and running at the high school. So those folks are ninth through 12th graders. Um, the goal for them is to eventually get them into the elementary schools and working with small groups of elementary schoolers um, because we know that younger kids really look up to older kids. Um, probably won't happen until next year, but they're starting that training um, and that facilitation this year with the intention of eventually getting into those schools. Um, the curriculum committee is working on definitions that we can use from elementary all the way up through high school um, so that we're all, all of our students have been exposed to the same vocabulary and have the same foundational understanding of what these terms mean um, to give us a really strong foundation to work from. Uh, the curriculum committee is also really focused on increasing the diversity in the literature that we use, both in the text that we're teaching in the classroom, and then also just what's available for students for their leisure reading. So what's available in our libraries, what's available in the classrooms. Um, the middle school is using the, the junior version of Stamped from the Beginning in both their social studies and their ELA curriculum this year. Um, so that's really exciting. And the science department participated in a professional development over the summer that looked at how science has played a role in racism um, and how we can start to kind of unpack that. And then also through that sort of looking at, okay, how can we include these topics in curriculum that it's not, it doesn't seem obvious that that's a place where you could talk about these things. Um, so they've been really excited about that and they've been bringing it to the curriculum subcommittee um, at a, on a larger scale. Any questions? Any Sorry, questions for Kelsey? <laughs> hmm? I was just seeing if anybody has any questions. I guess not. Uh, I'll ask a question, Kelsey. So uh, um, I'm Phil Canner Conway. So I, I, I thought that uh, I Everything that I'm listening to, I'm just, you know, saying more and more and more right on. And, um, and you know, what, what I'm thinking of is the, the letter that we got a couple of days ago from the Deerfield Inclusion Parent Parental Inclusion Group. And I thought that that letter made a really good point about how it's not enough to just do the right things. It's, 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 it's you know, to say you're doing it and to explain why you're doing it and you know, like I, I noticed that our count and they brought up the um, Columbus Day change. And I, I'll just say from, from a school committee point of view, it was a, a, a few years ago. I remember bringing the topic up in, in school committee. And at the time, I think made a motion on it. And I think I was the only one that said, let's change this. Um, and then uh, this year's school calendar, poof, it's Indigenous Peoples Day. 
but we've never, as a community, as a school, we've never said this is we did this and why we did it. And um, that's not true, Phil. We voted oh. it on the agenda, and we voted Indigenous Peoples Day my first year here. Sorry. Okay. Well, Sorry, I'm, we did. So that's why I'm saying the calendar, the original calendar that went out, did not have the change on it. Then was updated um, because we caught the error because it was the first year where we actually built the calendar with that in there. But you guys did that. Okay, good. I'm glad to be wrong. Um, but, but but I do hear what it, you're saying that like that education piece is important. Um, so part of part of what students are getting the day after they watch that film um, is education about what is anti-racism. Like we keep using this buzzword, what does that actually mean? Um, and then also breaking down, okay, we're gonna try to stop using the N-word, why? Why do we care? Why is that important? And we've got some videos with some different perspective, uh, different perspectives about why that's important. And then with changing the logo, that's a really big opportunity um, to do education about indigenous people and cultural appropriation. And you know why? Like, yeah, it seems like it's not a big deal. It's just feathers, but it is a big deal. And here's why. Yeah, and I always thought as a school we have we have a special. Um, a, a special obligation in that regard, just for where the building's at. The building is on the site of a battlefield with indigenous people. Um, so that's, we lose sight of that a lot, I think. Yeah. Okay, that's all. Thank you though. Does anybody, anybody else have anything for Kelsey? Kelsey, thank you for giving us an update. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Take care. Have a good night. You too. Uh, Darius, we'll get back to the other important topic, snow days. <laughs> so it, it seems like a small thing, but it's actually a big thing and it does affect our lives of our community quite a bit. And that, there's no rules on what you're supposed to do about this, but the commissioner said basically this year and for this year only, you can have <clears throat> remote education on snow days. So you no longer have to have snow days. You can have remote days. And I'm just kind of seeking input on, you know, we're a difficult district with the five communities all have to be doing the same thing. So whether or not we do a joint committee again that makes such a vote and that kind of stuff. But I'm also just kind of get, gathering people's ideas and kind of just getting the overall thoughts on remote days and snow days. And so let me just kind of give you a quick overview of what I see some of the challenges are. And then just a real brief conversation about this tonight. We don't have to go down the rabbit hole of it. But um, there is the concerns that with snow days and such that the people, either teachers or students may not have internet or have internet that goes down in every storm or electricity, depending on the type of storm we have. So if we just say it's an instant remote, there could be students and teachers that aren't able to do it. Um, we could possibly combat that by doing blizzard bags, which basically means we're doing asynchronous learning instead of synchronous learning, live remote learning as we normally do, or we try to do a combination of both. So we could try to overcome it, but it's not gonna be perfect no matter what the model we choose if we choose to do that. Um, again, the teachers, um, teachers again, the teacher's ability to work remotely, especially if it comes on suddenly. If we know the storm's coming, everybody can prep. It's one of those Monday storms um, that we have a problem. I also wanna note that while last year this wasn't, you would say this wasn't a big deal, we only had two or three snow days, but we had a ton of two hour delays. And I know I'm, I'm capped in two hour delay in the area where we've had probably more two hour delays than most people around us. Um, just because I, you know, because we've been able to do it, but you really can't do a two-hour delay with our our current hybrid model, because by because you're teaching kids at the same time, you're going to be moving kids in with our breaks and that kind of stuff. It really, and you have lunch in the middle of the day. It really is just a mess. So you're really talking about those days are either going to have to be no school or remote learning. So you're really not talking about two or three days. You're talking about between like five and seven maybe total days. So it does increase more. And so. Um, this, I gave this example at Deerfield area tonight, the state of Rhode Island just made a decision for the state. They made it easy on people and they just said, the entire state of Rhode Island will not have snow days. Everything will be remote, end of story. So they made it easy for you know those communities. Our state, it's local control. So um, I don't know if I'm making a decision, I don't know if it should be a school committee decision, but it certainly is something we should talk about here, get input on um, and so forth. So I guess any thoughts on that? I mean, that's, I kind of gave you the overview. 
I'll, I guess I'll start. I, I see both sides to it where it's plus and minus. Um, you know, seeing it from my kid's standpoint, you know, and getting a break from sitting in front of a computer, waking up and hearing it's a snow day, that's very exciting for them. Um, at the same time, if we have the luxury to be able to keep school going, I can see the benefit in that too. When you bring up the idea about the two hour delay, I think it does raise a lot of concerns because one thing if we had, you know, four or five snow days, but if you're going to turn those two hour delays into cancellations, and now we're at the end of the year with eight snow days that we have to make up, I don't, you know, I don't think that's a great idea either. And I don't know if we can, you know, pick and choose what's going to be a cancellation and what's going to still be a, a, a remote day at home, or if we have to choose like one direction and then we end up really hurting ourselves at the end of the year. I don't know. Those are my thoughts. We can choose anything, but I think what we've learned from reopening the schools this year is keep it simple because we made the most complex reopening of schools possible. Um, because we are trying to get so many different kind of factors in. I think that's one of the things when people say, if you could do things over again, what would you do different? I'd say I'd make things a lot simpler, a lot, you know, scheduling a lot more basic, the rollout, just a very basic, so the parents could follow along. I think people, I'm even my own self thinking about, okay, so tomorrow is supposed to be three inches of snow. Do I, it's right now, I'm sitting there, there's a weather forecast, this is real. Do I wait till the following morning to call it a remote day? Do I wait, you know what I mean? Like it's, I think, we got to have some simplicity to it. You know, if we get over eight inches of snow, do we cancel school at that point? Because we're going to have massive power, you know, that kind of stuff. And there's going to be issues. But I think no matter what we do, I mean, the one thing I like about Rhode Island is they made it basic, straightforward, like it or not, this is what we're going to do. And I know Amherst did the same thing, although Amherst hasn't able to get the kids back at school yet. So they don't have to really worry about that yet. I'm just smiling at you, Keith. Um, but the, uh, but you know, they have, they just, they voted as a school committee to have all remote days, not snow days this year. So that was the idea of me kind of also bringing it, let me bring the school committee, get thoughts on it. Like we're not voting it tonight, but we're just collecting ideas, maybe get some chatter in the community to get in your ear about what people think. Um, I don't know. If we didn't, if we didn't have to worry about Conway having five inches of snow and everybody else having a dusting, that could make it a big difference. Sorry, Phil. So uh, I would just say that the that the two hour delay turned into a cancellation is sort of the worst of both worlds and ought to be avoided. So uh, that's my feedback. So in other words, if we have a, a two hour delay, would we'll just make it a full remote day? Correct. Is that what you're thinking? Or, or a full cancellation? I mean, I you know I. I, uh, listening to you, Darius, it seems like there's going to be these days where you're going to have advance notice and it would be OK to implement a remote day. But um, some of these iffy ones, it, cancellation so that, I mean, it, right in June, in June, at least the COVID thing should be a little bit better. Um, and prom the promise of, a, of an actual day in school um, sounds better than re all remote. But. Yeah, I, I mean, but I would say, and I think the teachers on the this would agree that the quality of the not just the quality, this is probably the wrong word to use, but kids are far more engaged in um, February and March than they are in the third week of June. You know what I mean? And those days, you know, even if you're making up or doing part lessons, you're kind of moving the curriculum forward. You're probably getting more out of those remote days than you would out of a June fifteenth day. You know what I mean? After the seniors are gone and, you know, it gets kind of whatever. Missy? Yeah, it, seems like, it seems like the theme for this year, though, is hybrid and that this is another situation for just more of the same, more hybrid. Um, yeah. Missy? I, I guess my thought is that if, if we can do it on those days where, like, the roads are a little slick, but there's – it's unlikely that there's going to be enough stuff that it's going to knock out power. That seems like it makes the most sense on those kind of days to just plan for a remote day as opposed to, you know, everything shut down because everybody's shoveling all day. I don't know if you can put that into kind of a blanket inches amount, but. Well, thank you. 
Olivia? Um, I kind of agree along that. And part of that is um, the whimsical just snow days. Like, that's so fun, right? And and kids, everyone, you know, for, to wake up and be like, it's a snow day. To take that completely away with all of the other things we've taken away. I mean, we've had to, but it just seems like one more, like, nail in the like. I would just, I agree if, you know, some should be remote, you know, if it's going to be slick or that kind of stuff. But if it's a blizzard out there and there's a chance that a 15 and a 17 year old are going to go out sledding, you know what I mean? Let's let them do that, really. <laughs> That's good. Anybody else have a little comment? Missy? Just because it's 2020 and we should probably talk about things being the worst case scenario, uh, maybe it's also worth thinking about if we do reach however many snow days and we're going to work on extending the school year, maybe then we think about any subsequent school days, any subsequent snow days become remote so that we aren't then taking away next summer from all these kiddos and taxing everybody with more days of trying to figure out how to make this work for an extended school year. Good thoughts. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm going to all the committees, getting everybody to give me some feedback and I'll kind of come, I'm hearing similar themes though. It's kind of some sort of balance between go remote when you get those slippery days where you would do two hour delays. And if we're getting a nor'easter getting thumped, then maybe we have to cancel just because of, you know, um, you know, the different chores that people have to do and responsibilities even family members have in those bigger things. And I won't even say the whimsical because I think I said that a couple of years ago to the school community. I got laughed at by some people. I said, there's nothing magical about snow days. I remember you guys made fun of me. I'll add to, um, <laughs> I think no matter what direction we go, I think it really should be a district-wide decision. And if that means having a joint meeting, you know, to get everyone else on board, because I mean, I have a kiddo in an elementary school and a kid in, in at Frontier, and if one if one gets a snow day, gets to go skiing, you know, or sledding, and the other sit in front of a computer, I'm going to have a pretty upset kid. Well, given the fact that I have kids in the exact same situation, one at Frontier, one at Deerfield, they're going to have the same thing. Let's just put it that way. Now. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, I agree with the district wide thing. I think you know. It, whatever we decide, even if it's not perfect, it needs to be everybody on board. It definitely would be, it definitely would be. It's just a, you know, and I'm not even sure if we have to do it through a school committee vote, I can just let everybody know what we're doing, but after I take everybody's information and I'll find out, I don't know where the, the authority line is, but it is a community, it's gonna, it's a community impact decision. So I really wanted to get the, you know, your thoughts on it. So thank you. Thanks everybody. Um, First readings on the harassment policy, Darius. Yep. So this is a the new the law got changed this summer under Title IX, and this is a pretty lengthy um, it's a pretty lengthy policy that also includes procedures in the, in the, in the back end of it. And so um, I'll give you a kind of quick overview of where the policy, the major changes were in this policy. It's an important policy for us. Um, because it is legally, um, it's our responsibility as employers to be, um, you know, obviously um, handling um, issues of of, um, of sexual harassment, basic harassment, um, and, and so on and so forth. And so it, it, we have to make sure that we do it correctly. Whenever we enter any of these things, I'm obviously working with legal counsel throughout it, but we have to have the policy on the books that says how we are going to deal with this and that it follows the law. So this is a law right now. You can play with some of the wording in some of the different areas and our attorneys have, um, but I'll, I'll go through the, the major points of this just so you kind of know what you're looking at. Um, the, the law changed the narrowing the definition of sexual assault under Title IX. Um, it's limited the obligation to investigate complaints to only conduct that occurs um, in the school's program or activity not related to off-campus conduct. Um, it talks about the mandatory response and obligation of schools, i.e. providing supporting supportive measures. Um, there's also a change in the standard for school liability. Um, it's actually increasing the school's liability that we do we follow up and we, and we do the steps within the law. It's a more detailed grievance procedures that will alter the way the school 
the schools process and respond to complaints. The big thing there is that before you used to have one um, Title IX officer who would do the investigation and um, kind of carry the thing all the way through. Now you have different investigators reporting back to the Title IX officer. So it's a very different way of how investigations around um, you know, uh, reports will be done. Um, it also talks now that hearings are optional, but written, request, written questions are required for K-12 schools. Um, and then there's the kind of the big schools may choose what standard of evidence to use, um, either preponderance of evidence or clear and convincing um, evidence. So within that, it's just basically how schools are going to make their, their judgments on that. Um, and then schools must offer both parties an appeal from a determination regarding um, responsibility. So there has to be a, a better, better appeals process. So these are the major changes from your last policy. Again, it's kind of legal. It's led by the law in our, this came from our attorneys kind of process the law and, and, and propose this, this policy. It's a little different than MASC's policy that was proposed. Um, the big change there different is that the MASC policy allowed the, um, it allowed the person being charged to have a face-to-face -face hearing with the victim. And that was an option that the attorney, our attorney felt that that should not be an option within this, that a victim should have the right to not have to face um, face the person they're, they're, they're accusing of and that they will follow the other steps within that. So um, this is the first reading. So if you do have questions on this, I would say 90% or 95% of the questions I'd run to legal counsel with because it is following those steps. So if you have those, if you could shoot me an email ahead of time, I can I can reach out to legal counsel and get those answers for you. But it's an important policy um, because again, it's how we, um, you know, it's how we take care of our, all the people in our district. This is not just for faculty, it's also for students, it's for school committee members, it's school, school volunteers, anybody under our jurisdiction and how we protect them. So, um, so again, first reading tonight and then we'll go to our next meeting. Good. Um, we'll go right on to the next one here. Uh, oh, first reading a revised policy, BEDH. So again, that was that's the policy that we 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 looked at last last month um, under um, public comment in the language around the public comment, and I did again change it slightly and added that people we do have some better tools now within Google. I mean, I mean, we have, with Google Meet here, where um, I can stop people from taking over the screen. <laughs> so um, basically what this is opening up to is one, we can, um, members of the public who'd like to speak during public comment may request to, an invite to the meeting to speak at the meeting. Um, and so they can simply just list, know that they're coming to the meeting and I can send them an invite. It doesn't make it a public invite where people can kind of um, drop in, um, but it does, allow for us to have the person speaking in person, and of course, the ability for people to send in written comments. What was interesting about the written comments that we'd never kind of thought about before was brought up at the Conway School Committee. This is where, when we break apart, some people actually have different ideas in different meetings. Um, it allows people who can't attend our meetings to give us feedback on stuff. And so I think that's a thing we didn't really consider that they don't have to be available to be at this meeting to give their thoughts on something, they can send us a letter and that can be read during public comment. So um, I thought that was an interesting kind of point as well. So we're actually increasing access within this policy here. So anyway, that's where I did, I you know, looking into recorded messages and that kind of thing, it was a, it was a nightmare. I don't know how to do it. Um, I mean, if anybody has any ideas, you can give me those ideas, but um, you know, there's the ability to, if someone really wants to talk and have their voice heard, be able to invite them to the meeting and speak during public comment, I thought was, um, was a good idea. And then also we reduced that 24 hours. I forget what committee gave me what ideas because each committee kind of um, gave um, thoughts on it, but reducing it to that afternoon, people could, uh, you know, right up until um, three o'clock that day. And the three o'clock is based on the business hours of Donna being able to have an hour to deal with whatever comes in by three o'clock to get to me. Because if I'm in a meeting and I'm the person who has to do that, you know, if I'm dealing with an issue, I got to have someone who's available to process those um, public comments. Or request. So, do we have to vote on the revised? Policy? So, this one I did a reading 
a reading and then a voting on for next meeting because there was no need to emergency change it. This is what we have kind of what I have in place right now. Um, but you have you have the other one that have, that, that allowed something in place before that. Okay. Missy, you have a question? Yeah, I, is there a space on like if you were a community member or a parent who was going to the website, how would you know that this is what our policy is? You wouldn't you wouldn't know our policy, but you would know in our postings, it explains how to do the, the how to do the public comment. So, so you'd have to you'd have to click on the agenda. Correct. So, so right, like you have to click on the agenda to get the streaming link, and underneath the streaming link it says for public comment, and it has the whole issue there. So I hear what you're saying though. We should get that yeah. posted somewhere else. Well, I, I was just wondering if there was a brief way to to put it if you were looking for how do I know when the school committee is meeting and how do I give them insight? Can you give them my opinion? Is there a, a brief way to put that where somebody would go looking for when the meeting's coming up? We could easily do that. That's a great idea, Melissa, because we could, um, you have your own link on our website for school committee. And then I could have one of the drop downs says public comment. And then we could have this language and how to do that on there. So that, that's a good idea. Yeah, that is a good one. That's a great idea, Missy. Thanks. Anybody else have a question? Okay. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and do that good idea. If you don't mind, Missy, I'll just steal that. And everybody will say, that's superintendent. That's a great idea of fixing that. That's, that's fine. Uh, you can borrow it. <laughs> <laughs> borrow it. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, foreign trips. So Who's basically... <laughs> Yeah, so this one's straightforward. Again, um, right now you have approved trips that could possibly be happening this spring. Um, and I'm asking you to cancel all your trips. The reason why I'm doing that is that many of the companies that we do foreign trips with will not refund unless the school committee cancels the trip. Okay, so we've already canceled the Dutch exchange, which we didn't use a travel agency for that. We've been doing kind of things to save money outside of the travel agency. Um, but there were other trips um, in the queue, they were coming, one I believe was to Spain, that we're gonna do remotely with, combined with Northampton. Um, George, you can jump on if you remind, if you can remember the other ones. Um, uh, I believe Carla was going to, I believe Carla was gonna be going to Germany. Um, and, and let's see, Spain, Germany, um, they're potentially, I'm trying to remember if New Zealand was also happening. New Zealand may have, may have been happening as well. So, so, the, there were a few. A, so the idea on this is that you would cancel it, I don't think, Again, my opinion is right now we shouldn't be endorsing trips leaving the country right now with, you know, we could barely have schools. We can't have school in full session sending students on a plane where they could be come down with COVID in another country um, and then not be able to travel, I think is a big no-no right now. Um, however, we can always, once the question is, can we reapprove them later? Absolutely. The idea is that we cancel so that we have that documentation so that people can get refunds um, and, um, and so forth. And that's basically what the that some of these companies have asked for that the school committee votes that you can't just go on your own or people can't just with withdraw and get their money back and then when things get better they'll come back to you to approve the next trip overseas so that's kind of the the thought there do you want us to vote on that sir it's raising his hand okay yeah is this um Trips like Washington, Gettysburg too, or is this just foreign trips? We actually haven't approved the DC trip yet. So you're not going to be unapproving anything there. So the DC trip hasn't been officially canceled yet, but it hasn't even been officially proposed yet. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with the DC trip. You know, obviously right now it doesn't look good. Um, they're they're not planning on they're not planning on it happening this year, Darius. Okay. So, but we, right now you'd be canceling all trips that you've already approved and then any new trips that would come forward, you would then either approve or not approve, but it would fall under that, your purview there. I'm not sure who was first, Olivia, were you first? So Judy? I didn't have a comment. I was just gonna make a motion to cancel the trips. Okay, Judy, do you have something? I just was gonna say we didn't have a vote on the thing. So as long as this just goes under the guideline of like, handling things in a timely fashion, that's fine. 
So we don't have to vote on it, Darius, you're saying then, right? No, no I think I need, he's saying we do. Okay. We do. Yeah. Livy, you made the motion? Yep. Back up. I'll Billy, second. second. I'll, I'll second it. Okay. So many seconds. Uh, yes. Two. Yeah. Hold on. I'm just typing. Since it wasn't there. Uh, roll call vote, Bob Halla? Yes. Ken <coughs> Robert? Yep. Bill Cantor? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Judy? Yes. Mary? Yep. Uh, Damien? Yes. Bill? Yes. Uh, Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. There you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be going in executive session, MGL Chapter 38, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy session and preparation contract negotiation with non-union personnel, GRIPCO transportation. Everybody's going to cancel out of this meeting. In other words, get out of this meeting permanently, and you'll, you'll re-log in once we get done with the executive session. You'll re-log in. Don't, don't keep it open, but log out and we'll, um, and we'll go to executive session, but, um, I need a motion and a second and they need a roll call. Motion. Second. Who was the second? Sorry. Bill. Yep. Thank you. Uh, roll call, Bob. Yes. Lynn. Yep. Bill. Yes. Olivia. Yep. Judy, yes. Mary? Yep. Damien? Yep. Bill? Yes. Keith? Yes. Uh, Missy? Yes. All right, 802. We're going to get out of this one. We're going to executive session. All right, I think 13 okay. is the right amount because 12 is when we went in and we come back and Allison was here. So 13 is correct, I believe. So, Bob, you are free to move about the cabin. Yeah, um, so I need a motion on the MOA. I didn't hear I didn't hear anybody yet. Move, Mr. Chairman. Bill? Thank you. You need a second? I'll second. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, okay, roll call. Yeah. Bob Hella. Yeah. Lynn. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Bill. Yes. Olivia. Yes. Judy. Yes. Mary. Yes. Damien. Yes. Bill. Yes. Keith. Yes. Missy. Yes. That would be approved. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, I have nothing as a chair for reports. Uh, Lynn, anything from the collaborative yet? Uh, they had a meeting, but I had open house, so I couldn't go. I could get the speed next month. Thanks for your services. <laughs> Anytime. George? Is George with us? No, did he? Uh... I, told, I told George gave the his speech there earlier. I, I let yeah. him go. I texted okay. him. Said, Don't wait for us. Go get some sleep just to make Allison upset. <laughs> She's still with us. She made George stay too. Darius, do you have anything for us? I, I sent out a sup superintendent's report. Um, and let me just kind of hit the highlights of it just so because so the public knows certain things. Um, usually in October, we, we present our school improvement plans. In many months, they end up getting pushed to November. I'm asking that we uh, have the principals re um, present those in December. Um, obviously, the reopening of schools was is, is quite the task and still ongoing. So um, and I imagine much of the school room plan is going to be based on our hybrid and remote model and working around that, um, as well as our um, working with racism and diversity. So um, I think we're kind of already hitting the ground running on those things. So expect to see those in December. Um, I want to note that uh, Meg Birch, our nurse leader, um, as you know, we ha we had a uh, a um, 
a uh, scholarship, a <laughs> grant. <laughs> it's like a scholarship for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what happens? I mean, this is what happens when I have back to back meetings and I'm getting giddy at the end. Um, that we did have a grant to take care of the majority of her position. However, I do need her full time based on the demands, the health demands that the COVID crisis has, has, has presented us and our nurses and our staff and, and students and tracking down the any cases or people getting tested and, and providing advice and telling people what to do. And so um, and she's working around the clock on that. So we are, I asked to, um, I didn't ask, I went and did it. Um, I put her as full time and we're gonna have to find money. Um, if Shelly's here, she can explain that we're gonna find money from different portions of the budget to come up with the extra, I forget it was about 10 or 15,000 to cover her the full way um, because it's an important position in the, during this time. Yeah. Um, I have been meeting with our town administrators. I met with them last week the, with the four towns talking about school finances, the COVID funding. Um, and also, you know, we're going to have an interesting budget season next year. That also reminds me that usually in this meeting, we talk about budget calendar. Um, and so we don't have a budget calendar for the yet. It's going to be, you know, we don't have a state budget yet, and that might not come until December. So it's going to be a busy spring as we process with the state comes up with a budget and if that's going to affect any of the schools frontier will be okay because we're a regional school and the kind of people are already locked in what they have to pay us um but you know as the towns and the our elementary schools may have to work with any any issues that the this year's budget if, if, if the state does anything funny with that and then next year's budget is supposed to be a difficult budget so um you know it's going to be a, it's going to be a long spring in the budget season i have been doing bi-weekly meetings with the boards of health um, from all four towns, kind of giving them updates what we're doing. They're also planning, you know, the flu clinics that happened this past weekend. And I know now they're talking about, um, you know, other doing other things for the community as well. Um, as those put together, I just want to tip my hat to, to Carolyn, um, Carolyn Ness um, from the Deerfield Board of Health who's kind of led those meetings and putting them together. And at those meetings, we have police, EMS, and then school and other health officials. I'm still part of the new superintendent induction program, believe it or not, even though I'm probably one of the veterans in Franklin County now with all the changes that have happened. Um, but I'm in my third year of that. Um, this year's focus is, you know, looking at equity in schools, we're continuing to look at equity in schools, and then obviously reopening in the COVID environment. Um, and I'm also working, um, been part of a focus group from the Donahue, UMass Donahue Institute, which is looking at the program and its anti-racism and equity um, um, curriculum that it, it gave to uh, superintendents. So I'm doing that as well. Um, I do want to thank the um, community for their donations. There's been a lot coming into our various schools. I wish for, I wish uh, I kept uh, George on for him to do that. I'll make sure he does that in the next meeting. I did receive um, 2,500 masks today from the um, Rotary of Fr Franklin County. And so I want to thank the, the Bezo family who orchestrated this donation and dropped them off today. But I know there's many other people who have been donating um, time funds and things to the schools to get them up and running this year. So I just want to say thank you. And then I have my ongoing superintendent projects that are happening. You know, we are working, you know, there's a lot of work behind the scenes regarding COVID and community and case management. Management. We are working, you know, any kind of pop-up of either cases or suspected cases or concerns. We're watching them, Meg, Meg Birch and I, myself are in communication all through the weekend and dealing with those different things. Um, we are still negotiating um, with both Union 838 and Frontier on the many different management and operation issues that have come up with the new schedules and our two formats of education. Um, budgets I already kind of talked about, but that's, you know, we'll be starting to build those pretty soon. Um, and I do want to kind of note um, that our, our uh, administrative team is putting together its own PD around anti-racism and equity and how to do it from a leadership perspective. Um, we did have a meeting today of professional development for an hour and a half with Dr. Elizabeth Pryor, who does a lot of work around um, the N-word and the N-word in education and the N-word in the classroom. And she was just fabulous. Like I said, we talked for about an hour and a half today um, with myself and the administrative team and just talking about um, different struggles we've had as leaders and and working around the N-word and what it means and how does it how does that trickle out to other things that happen in schools. Um, and tomorrow we have that as part of our administrative team meeting to kind of finalize that PD planning. And so I'll I'll present that the next month's um, the next month's uh, meeting as well. Um, the Frontier Capital Project. So we are we are still moving forward with the track for to go out to bid probably January February. I'm waiting right now on the final plans 
and the bid specs for um, coming out of um, uh, Berkshire um, Berkshire Design. So uh, when we get that, um, you know, uh, we'll be probably reporting that next month as well. But again, that's going to be going on the 23 finance year. We will look at capital projects for next year. I think it's going to be, I just said to the Deerfield community, um, that you know, we're going to go look at a very difficult year next year, and we're probably going to really work with our towns to make sure that our capital projects, are, we're not asking too much from our towns, because I think they're going to be struggling next year. So, you know, we'll be still developing our planning, but know that we probably may be asking for less, just knowing that next year is going to be very difficult on our communities. So um, that's pretty much it. So I just wanted to kind of give that update. Thanks. Any questions on all that? A lot going on, uh, obviously. Is, she, is Shelly still on? I'm here. Shelly, do you want me to come in and sign this MOA in the near future? Yes, it will have to get signed, but it has to get signed by everybody, and we need to fix those clerical errors first. Just, just send me a, an email or something when you're ready, and I'll come in and sign it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Yep. Uh, Bob? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Bill? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yep. Bill? Yes. Keith? Yes. And Missy? Yes. All right, 28. Good night, everybody.